will always have a chance at the outset of class as well. And as you know by now, I'm more than happy to take class uh, lectures, uh, I mean uh, questions uh, in the middle of uh, lecture. But uh, if you have any questions, you know, and you want to come prepared with them, that's fine as well. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Netflix does, they do have it. Whether it's one of those movies that you can actually watch online with Netflix, you know, there's a, there, there's a provision that there's some films that they make available. That I wouldn't really know. But uh, I don't really see why you would have to go to Netflix because you don't have to go to the media library to see that film. You can see it from any uh, campus or dorm computer. And you can see it any number of times if you registered for the class, which all of you obviously are, you know. So it's, actu it's already available. There's a system, it's called video furnacing or something. Uh, I'm, I've actually done it with a film class that I've taught, whereby all the films that are used for that course, uh, what they do is they digitize a film, and then, in fact, the entire quarter of the film is available to you, and you can watch it any number of times. So this is a film that uh, you really should see. You might even get a question or two uh, uh, in the final exam. Uh, you know, which uh, might ask you something about the film. And I think the film is mentioned in week eight or nine of the syllabus. I forget exactly at what point you're, you know, you really do have to see it. But uh, it's, it's available as of this moment. So for those of you who are interested, you can go and see it. It is one of the absolute masterpieces of mainstream Indian cinema. In fact, I'm writing a whole book just on this film. Uh, so it's, some, it's a film that, you know, I mean, it looks like uh, a, a film, uh, a typical, as they say, Bollywood film uh, uh, to those who don't really have a trained eye, uh, which in some respects is all of us, because the only way to really be able to see the cinema and analyze it is to start thinking about it and to train yourself to see what's really going on on, on the screen, you know. Okay. So... Um, the short answer is that, yeah, I mean, look, I don't really know about the Netflix, whether you can, I mean, I know that they have it, but you don't really have to worry about Netflix because, as I said, you can watch it from any campus or dorm computer, okay? Uh, any other questions? Yeah. It's on campus, yeah. When I say campus computer, that's what I mean, that you have to be on campus. You can't watch it in the San Fernando Valley or in Pasadena or wherever else you might be, you know. Yeah, Peter. Okay, fine. <laughs> good, good addition to the information I already have. Anything else? Yeah. No, no, no. This, uh, this, uh, this is a, this a film that you're seeing is a 1975 film with uh, an actor called Amitabh Bachchan. Uh, if there's any South Asian who don't know, who doesn't know about Amitabh Bachchan, then they're not South Asian. Um, because, I mean, this man has been an icon of Indian cinema for four decades, you know. Uh, so, uh, and, and this film, uh, we'll, we'll get to a discussion of it, obviously, you know, when we come to that point at week eight or nine, but it's really a landmark film. But it's not the film that you're referring to. Yeah. Uh, yes. You read as much of it as you can. Yeah, yeah, because it's really an overview particularly an overview from 1989. This is the main reading for this week, uh, Power and Contestation, and it's really a kind of a reading which is a backdrop to, you know, and gives you a short account of what's happening. It's a short work. It uh, doesn't really look at the period from 1947 until uh, the 1980s, except very briefly because the bulk of the book is focused on the last 20 years, you know. But yeah, uh, you read, uh, re read, uh, read it cover to cover. Uh, if if uh, the syllabus doesn't specify page numbers, for a reading, that means you have to do the, that entire reading, you know, yeah. All right, any, any, any further questions at all? All right, let me uh, resume the narrative, but before I do it from where I stopped, and you might recall that I was talking about the distinction between India as a civilization and India as a nation state, uh, and I've given you what I consider to be this rather magnificent kind of example uh, of the national anthem, and. Uh, the plurality there, and I will return to that in a moment, but before I do that, uh, let me uh, refresh your memory about some of the other major points uh, which uh, I would urge you to keep in mind. Uh, you might recall that in my previous lecture, I had mentioned to you two uh, fundamental uh, things that we had to think about with respect to Indian politics in the post-1947 period. In the immediate 
aftermath of 1947, that is, because obviously to some extent those questions, uh, particularly the question of reorganization of Indian states. So the two questions were the reorganization of Indian states on a linguistic basis, uh, which I will uh, explain to you in greater detail uh, with the map that I have here in a moment. And the second was the creation of the Constitution of India. Um, in 1950, which it came into effect in 1950, but the Constituent Assembly uh, is the organization or the body of people that came together to draft the Constitution. They obviously started working on it a few years before that, right? Um, and so uh, 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 the other thing that I want to recapitulate is that if you're looking at the period 1947 and its immediate aftermath, uh, the things that we have talked about uh, are the partition of India, obviously. Uh, the creation of Pakistan, uh, the assassination of Mohandas Gandhi, okay, the immense migrations that took place uh, uh, in uh, 1947 and the very, very early part of 1948. And this is uh, Hindus who move from what becomes Pakistan uh, to India and Muslims moving from uh, Pakistan uh, uh, from India to what is going to become Pakistan and the movement of Sikhs as well. And you remember that I talked about the fact that the partition took place both on this part of the country, the eastern part of the country, uh, and on the western frontier as well. And then the last major sort of political uh, set of events had to do with the integration of the Indian states. And the example that I taken uh, there was the example of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, we could complicate all of these narratives. Uh, very considerably if we wanted to. So for example, uh, let me just give you an illustration of what I mean. Uh, you recall that the problem in Kashmir had to do with the fact that the Maharaja or the ruler uh, uh, was a Hindu ruler and the bulk of the population of Kashmir, uh, uh, particularly of the part which really is, if I may put it this way, the uh, the central most desirable part of Kashmir from the point of view of political actors and that is the uh, the, uh, the the valley, you know, where Srinagar is uh, located, right, uh, which is right over here. Uh, now, uh, uh, one way to complicate it is to, to look at uh, a state in what is today called Gujarat, a state called Junagar, which was also uh, a um, native state. And in uh, Junagar, you had uh, a situation that was reversed, where you had a population that was, in fact, actually predominantly Hindu, okay, predominantly Hindu, the ruler was a Muslim. The situation is reversed here, right? And if we go through the details of that, one of the things that you're going to find out is that the ruler decided that he was going to, in fact, sign a treaty of accession to Pakistan, because remember that was an option, right, for a native state. The native state could opt to become a part of India or could opt to become absorbed into Pakistan. Right? And in this case, the ruler decided that, uh, that the state would be absorbed into Pakistan. Uh, well, there was, going to, there was going to be a kind of, if I may put it this way, a satyagra, a movement of resistance, except that it wasn't entirely nonviolent. Right? And eventually, to cut a very long story short, Junagar eventually becomes a part of India. And so, of course, this is the kind of thing that Pakistan has always talked about. And, and in some respects, legitimately so, that uh, here we have an illustration of where the the pressures that were placed on the ruler okay, to renege, that is to change his decision eventually, okay, and for Junagar to get reabsorbed back into India. Well, why didn't something of that kind happen in Kashmir? I mean, that would be the argument that would be made, for example, in Pakistan, because there what you had was a Hindu ruler, the bulk of the population was Muslim. Uh, it's very clear that the ruler did not consult with his subjects before deciding what decision to take. But we could say that the decision was forced there uh, under the circumstances that I described to you in one of my previous lectures, right? So this is what I mean, that one could complicate these narratives, each one of them, and I'm just giving you a capsule form for, for most of them, all right? Now, uh, before I get back to this question of India as a nation state and a civilization and then pick up the narrative from there, let me revert back to this question of linguistic states for a moment uh, uh, because I think that uh, from this map here, you'll be able to get a better sense of what I meant when I talked about linguistic states. Uh, and uh, when we look at the question of linguistic states in India and the reorganization of Indian states, uh, I think that you will also have to keep in mind uh, the political uh, structures uh, in India. So uh, let me first say a little bit about uh, how the country is governed. And for those of you who keep up with the news, you might be interested in knowing 
uh, that the next general elections are about to be held in India. In fact, they're going to start on April 16th uh, of this month. Uh, and unlike the American election, which takes place always on a certain day every four years, uh, in, in India, the elections are held on a five-year cycle. Now, there have been some times when that has not been the case. Um, the first general elections were held in 1951. And in India, the elections take place over a period of one month. Okay, one month. So the decision is not going to be announced until May 16th. Okay, they start on April 16th. They're going to be announced one month later. It is the largest electorate in the world by a huge margin. I mean, there's nothing even remotely close to that anywhere in the world uh, in terms of a people, the number of people voting in a democratic uh, election. Uh, 670 million is the electorate at the present moment. Uh, the next largest electorate is the electorate for uh, elections to the European Parliament. Yes? Uh, what's the criteria for someone here to join the European Parliament? 18. 18, yeah. If you're 18 years old, you, uh, and you've lived in a certain constituency for six months or more, you're, you can vote. You have universal franchise in India, okay? Yeah. Um, so uh, what we have here is, as I said, a, an election that is actually staggered over a long period of time. Part of the reason why it's staggered over a very long period of time is because uh, uh, in a lot of the constituencies, for example, this is, by the way, what is referred to as Northeast India, this extremity that you see over here, number of different states over here. Um, we're going to talk about them on a later occasion. Uh, but in Northeast uh, India, you have uh, a fair amount of political disturbance, okay, insurrections, if I may put it this way. So one of the reasons the elections are staggered is that uh, they have to have a sufficient number of armed troops available in the state for the election to be held, to make sure that the election is being held under conditions that are fair, okay? Right, uh, and uh, roughly you're talking about one to two million, you know, voting stations in India during the general elections. And of course, each of these voting stations has to be, or election booths, has to be actually protected uh, by the armed forces. All right. Um, now, um, uh, when you have an election, you have an election to uh, the. Uh, you, you don't. Uh, you, you don't elect uh, a uh, person to the position of. Uh, or the post of the prime minister, because it's the same system as you have in Britain. That is, the, that the party, which in fact actually means, wins the majority of votes, or uh, in a coalition, they may not have a majority, but they may be able to put together a coalition. That particular winning coalition or winning party will decide who will be the person who will be appointed to uh, hold the position of the prime minister, which is uh, the highest office of the government. Right? You do have a president. Uh, in the Indian Republic, but the president occupies the same position in the Indian Republic as the monarch does in the British system, right? So as we know, the queen is not uh, effectively, or whoever the successor to the queen will be, uh, is not really the person who effectively wields power. Um, and there are complications here as well. Let me give you a very simple uh, instance of what I mean by a complication. Um, let us suppose that in one of these states, you have political disturbances. So for example, in Gujarat, in 2002, you had a series of killings that took place where approximately 2,000 uh, Muslims were killed. Okay, um, and uh, this is something that we'll discuss in greater detail, you know, l later on. But the illustration that I want to give you is the following: So when you have a political disturbance or set of events of that magnitude, some people in the state might demand that the state legislative assembly be dissolved. Okay. In other words, they're, going to, they're stating that the state is ungovernable. The state cannot be governed under the normal circumstances. And they might call for the imposition of the president's rule. Okay, the president's rule. So in that case, the president of India, who is ordinarily a figurehead, becomes a rather important figure because then a call has to be made whether president's rule should be imposed on that state or not. And what it means to impose president's rule is that the, that the government that has been actually elected into power in that state is now being told that you have shown that you cannot govern the state, okay, and assure equality and justice to all the citizens, okay? And so therefore, we are dissolving the government, okay, and we're going to have fresh elections in that particular state. At that point in time, the president is obviously not a figurehead. Okay, not a figurehead because because what the president will then do if the president makes a decision in consultation with the ruling party, right? The president will say, okay, I'm going to impose president's rule, and then the president's 
appointee in that state assumes chief executive powers. All right, so this is an illustration of where, in fact, that office of the president is not always a, a, you know, a figurehead office, if I may put it this way. That office could become extraordinarily important in certain kinds of situations. Yes? No, no, there's not, no, if, if it looks like there is a kind of a, you know, a strong sentiment, okay, there's no, for example, referendum, right? So uh, if, if one could say, all right, there was a referendum in the state of Gujarat in 2002, and the referendum, the people decided by a majority that, hey, they don't want to be actually ruled by the ruling party, that the legislative assembly should be dissolved, and president's rule should be imposed. No, it doesn't take place that way. Okay? Basically, this is a political decision. It's taken on the basis of an assessment of how dire the situation is in that state, how loud are the noises calling for the imposition of the president's rule. And it's a political calculation, right? I mean, so just like any kind of political calculation when, when parties are jockeying for power, okay, the situation has gotten out of hand. So it's really a political decision. There's no, if I may put it this way, uh, procedure whereby you can assess the common sentiment in that state and say, well, we're making this decision on the basis of the common sentiment. Presumably, though, it would be done on that way, but that's usually not how it's done. And of course, the imposition of president's rule is not meant to be taken lightly. It's not meant to be imposed merely because, you know, five people got killed, right? But obviously, if you're talking about a pogrom or if you're talking about a massive killing or you're talking about economic turmoil whereby the states has shown that, in fact, it is not functioning properly anymore, then that might call for the imposition of president's rule. Yeah, question. Um, what were you saying, sorry, I missed the part about the president's appointee in the state? That's the governor. Because That's as, the governor. essentially what you have in each of these states is you have a chief minister. So the chief minister is a person who is a chief executive. That is a person who is actually making decisions in consultation with members of his or her cabinet. Okay, so the chief minister occupies in a state the same position that the prime minister of India occupies for all of India as a whole. Okay, but then in addition to the chief minister, you have a person called a governor. Okay, but the governor is in effect the figurehead. Okay, person who does not really wield power in that state, and that person can be viewed as the president's appointee. So that, of, that person is always there. It's just that during the time of the imposition of president's rule, for that period of time when a new legislative assembly has not come into power, the governor will in fact actually be the chief executive official of that state for that portion of time. Okay, so that's the role of the governor. Question over here. What if the majority of the citizens of the state, um, like, don't approve of the president's appointee? Well, there's no, there's no procedure to determine what the majority of the people of that state actually think. Right? This, is, this is what I meant when I said it's not as though the imposition of president's rule is taken, okay? is, is that the imposition of president's rule is something that you find after a referendum has been taken. Right? A referendum is, 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 is obviously some kind of voting mechanism where, where you say that, all right, we're going to just determine what is the sentiment of the people in that state okay? through a referendum. No. There is really no procedure for determining that the decision on the imposition of president's rule is a political decision which is taken in New Delhi, okay, in consultation with the ruling party. That's how it's really done. And it's not something that is done routinely, but it is done often and enough, right? So, for example, uh, there may be situations, as I said, in t Gujarat 2002, by the way, which did not lead to the imposition of president's rule. One of the reasons it didn't is because the, 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 uh, the political party that wielded power in Gujarat is the same political party that was wielding control over India as a whole. So obviously they are not going to tolerate a demand for dismissing the state government of Gujarat because that state government is basically the same government that's sitting in New Delhi. The imposition of president's rule is much more likely to take place when the ruling party, that is for the country as a whole, is in conflict with the ruling party at the state level. Okay, that's when the imposition of president's rule is more likely, right? Yes. So how often does it actually happen? Well, I mean, it doesn't happen that often, but there have been numerous instances, and again, we'd have to get into the nitty gritty of Indian politics, you know, to really see, you know, why 
the imposition of president's rule took place on certain occasions. You know, whether the imposition of president's rule has uh, uh, taken places under circumstances that are clearly illegal, for example. Okay, in other words, this was engineered by the state because the, by, by, the, by, by the state, now when I say the state here, I mean uh, the government of India, okay, the ruling party. It was engineered there because they found that uh, the state government in a particular state where president's rule was going to be imposed was not cooperative, okay? I mean, so it could have been done for that reason, right? So we know that, for example, the state of Kerala over here, southwest India, we know that president's rule was imposed uh, 20 years after independence there because the government of that state, this is by the way a communist state, okay, all right, so India is one of the few countries where the communists actually are elected to power in a number of different states, okay, and you're going to find out that the political situation in India in that sense is far more complex than it is in the U.S. where essentially you have two political parties, in my view, in fact, actually one political party masquerading as two, but whatever your own view of the re differences between Republicans and Democrats, in India, you certainly have a plurality of parties, okay, right? Uh, and so in, in, in the 1960s, uh, the state government of Kerala was dismissed by the imposition of President's rule, not because you had political disturbances, but for various other political reasons, such as the fact that the government of Kerala was not cooperative according to the government sitting in New Delhi, right? So there could be instances of that kind. I don't want you to get too detained by, by this, uh, you know, I was simply giving you an idea of the political structures that you find in India today, right? And uh, th this is really the backdrop to an understanding of the linguistic states and the political structure of India as a whole. So remember that what you have is you have a system of general elections because India is obviously uh, a functioning democracy, okay? Uh, and yes, one can dispute to what extent it is a functioning democracy, as one could dispute that, I think, for any democracy, right? And certainly in the course of the next eight or nine weeks, I think we'll have plenty of occasion to look at that. But you do have a system of general elections. The first one held in 1951. Uh, and uh, typically they're supposed to be held for, uh, 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 on a five-year cycle, okay? Uh, that cycle has been disrupted on a number of occasions. All right, now you have two houses, just like you do in the U.S., uh, and they're called the Lok Sabha, okay? Uh, which is the People's House uh, and the Rajya Sabha. Uh, the difference between this uh, parliament uh, and what you have in the United States is in the U.S., uh, both in the House and in the Senate, you have to be elected, okay? In India, uh, membership in the Rajya Sabha is not by election, it is by nomination, okay? So who gets elected, uh, who gets nominated to the Rajya Sabha? Distinguished artists, for example, might get, you know, nominated. A distinguished academic, once in a rare while, might get nominated to the Rajya Sabha. Uh, most of the appointees are political in that sense, okay? That is that, you know, you will, you will nominate to the Rajya Sabha, the ruling party will nominate to the Rajya Sabha whenever there is a vacancy, someone who they know has political views which align with their own, with the party's own political views, okay? So uh, uh, Rajya Sabha is uh, a, the, the, the upper house uh, of the Indian parliament. Um, in this large scheme of things, not that important. Of course, all bills have to be have to be uh, uh, passed by both the houses, okay, as they do in the United States. But as in the United States, where bills can only be generated, as I hope you know, in the House of Representatives, similarly, uh, in India, bills can only be generated, okay, in the Lok Sabha, okay? And the Lok Sabha is the people's house, okay? Lok here means people. Uh, there are 545 seats, okay, uh, representing a population of 1.2 billion roughly, okay? And so again, you've, you've got an immediate problem here, 545, okay, uh, you, you know, seats in all representing a population of a magnitude of 1.2 billion, um, and this is by election, okay, right? So the, the party that commands the Lok Sabha is a party that obviously is ruling the country, all right? And I have to say, by the way, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, you know, some uh, um, uh, sort of Indian, middle class Indians are highly ashamed to ad admit this, but this is the situation that you should know. Not less than one third of the people sitting, okay, uh, in the legislative assemblies and in the Lok Sabha. So when I say legislative assemblies, then I mean the legislative assembly of each state. 
just as you have a California Legislative Assembly, so each of the states has their own Legislative Assembly. Not less than one third of the people sitting there have proven criminal records. Okay? Proven criminal records. All right? and, and when I say proven criminal records, I'm not talking about minor theft or burglary. I mean, I'm talking about people who are sitting in Legislative Assemblies who've been elected to power against whom there are at least 100 cases that have been filed, including cases for murder, arson, rape. Right? And these people are actually sitting okay, uh, in the Legislative Assembly, in some cases in the Lok Sabha. And why is that possible? Because again, politics is partly a matter of the kind of patronage that you have. Right? What kind of money you can bring to get elected? Because as in the United States now, there's no question whatsoever that the amount of money you need to run for an Indian elections is now astronomical. Okay? And, and the numbers are always going up. They're never going down. Right? Uh, so the particular nexus between the criminals and the politicians is something that has certainly been a matter of some concern uh, uh, for Indian politics. And of course, one can use this data to try to interrogate the idea to what extent is it you know, a real democracy, you could say. Of course, you would have to then demonstrate that those who have criminal records uh, are less sensitive to their constituents okay, than those who do not. Right? I mean, so in other words, there's no necessary relationship between a person having a criminal record and that person not being sensitive to his or her constituents. In fact, that person might be more sensitive, for all you know, simply because that person obviously, in order to win an election with that kind of criminal record, obviously has had to rely upon certain kinds of networks, okay? Networks, right? Uh, and patronage as well, all right? But again, all of these things are things we look at in slightly greater detail later on. This is just giving you a broad kind of overview, okay? Uh, of how the system really works. Now, linguistic states, okay? If you, you can see the map is color coded here, and it's color coded not only to help you distinguish between the, the states, uh, but also because it gives you a very clear sense that you're talking about units that are separate. And the question is, what is the nature of this separation here? So if you look at Gujarat, the dominant language is Gujarati, Maharashtra dominant language is Marathi, Karnataka is Kannada, Right? Andhra Pradesh, it's Telugu, and so forth and so on. You could do that with all of these states. Right? Uh, one of the things that you have to bear in mind before we start looking at this picture in slightly greater detail is that in India, you have a rather complex linguistic situation because you have um, uh, the dominant language in terms of number of, uh, number of speakers okay, would be Hindi. That's a dominant language. Right? And uh, that is a language that is spoken predominantly in North India, so in this belt over here, you know, going from Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, you know, and uh, down into Madhya Pradesh over here, okay, Rajasthan. This is sort of what you might describe, if I may put it a circle this way, this is what you might describe as kind of the Hindi speaking belt, okay, right? Um, and uh, 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 Hindi has a status as the national language of India. Okay, the national language of India, which means, of course, by the way, that uh, a certain amount of Hindi uh, is inevitable in schools throughout India, right? So if you're studying in uh, Jammu and Kashmir or Gujarat or, you know, in West Bengal, wherever it is, at some point in time, you're going to have to pick up Hindi as well, okay? Uh, and this has been the cause of substantial resentment because if you look at the linguistic situation in India, you're talking about a number of dominant language groups. So one of the dominant, the, the, the major uh, language group is what you might describe as the Indo-Aryan or Indo-European, strictly speaking, Indo-European languages. Okay? And then you have what are called the Dravidian languages. And you also have these a group of languages uh, called Austroasiatic languages, which are basically languages um, that are spoken by tribal groups. Okay? Um, and when I say tribal groups, I'm including uh, groups of people such as the Mundas uh, and the Santals and so on. Right? So you basically have uh, three. three. Uh, I mean, you have other two. You have Tibeto-Burman languages, which are going to be spoken, for example, in the, uh, in the areas closer to uh, the upper reaches of the Himalayas, all right? uh, in places such as Arunachal Pradesh, which is here. All right? uh, but if you're looking at the bulk of the Indian population, you're saying that the major language group is Indo-Aryan or Indo-European, right? And these languages would include languages such as Marathi, which is the language of Maharashtra, Hindi, obviously, Gujarati, 
right? Uh, Bengali, which is spoken in the state of West Bengal in Bangladesh, and so on, right? And these, these languages are largely derived from Sanskrit, okay? The second major group is the Dravidian languages, which are the languages spoken down here in the south, okay? And so that would include the languages spoken in Karnataka, which is Kannada, and the language spoken in Andhra Pradesh, Telugu, in Tamil Nadu, which is Tamil, and the language spoken in Kerala, which is Malayalam, right? And I might say, by the way, as a general, general observation, that these four states down in the south, um, this is very often referred to as the Deccan. I mean, if you see references in the literature to the Deccan, uh, that's, what, uh, that's what it refers to. Uh, the Deccan is kind of a slightly, if I may put it this way, nebulous, uh, amorphous category because the Maharashtra uh, is also sometimes part of the Deccan. Uh, it really depends on how you look at it. But historically, you could say that there has been a, there has been a difference between South India uh, and uh, North India. And one of the differences has to do with the fact that the dominant language family in the, in the South is the Dravidian family. And in North India, it is the Indo-European languages. Did you, question over here? Yeah. That's right, Dravidian, okay, right? So this is, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at the linguistic distribution, this is really how it works out. Now, as I said to you that uh, in, uh, in India, Hindi has the status of a national language. Uh, the official language of India, by the way, is English, official, which means that when proceedings take place in the Lok Sabha, for example, Right? Um, speakers have an option. They can, uh, a, a member of the House of Lok Sabha can opt to speak in uh, English, can opt to speak in Hindi. Uh, technically, they can also opt to speak in Kannada or Tamil or Oriya, whatever the language might be, except that then you would have to have a system of simultaneous translations from all of these languages, which they don't. Okay? So in effect, what you're going to find is that people who are speaking uh, in uh, the Lok Sabha, a member of the Lok Sabha, um, that person, if they come from South India, they're almost always likely going to speak in English. They're not going to speak in Hindi. In fact, they see uh, the imposition of Hindi as the chauvinism of the North. Right? This has been a major issue in India. They've had, you've had big language riots taking place. So when, for example, um, uh, they try to teach Hindi, in the schools in South India, uh, you, had, you had riots that took place in several states, right? Because in the South, they see that as an imposition of the values and the languages of the North, and, and in this case, predominantly Hindi, right? In the states, the official position, in the states now, each of these states, is that you have, officially, you have three languages, okay, which a child would have to learn in school. Right? So if you are going to school in Andhra Pradesh, uh, let's say to you know, primary school in Andhra Pradesh, um, you would learn Telugu, and you would learn Hindi, and you would learn English. Right? That's your official position. Um, you're going to find, obviously, that in some cases, this regulation is going to be flouted. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be followed all the time. Uh, and generally, uh, the instruction is going to be in the mother tongue for the most part. And it's only at a later stage that they're going to start working with Hindi uh, and English. And the situation that I'm describing to you, of course, is in some ways a, an ideal situation because one of the things that happened when they created these linguistic states, right? And remember that how it, how it was done. The idea was that after independence, you needed to reorganize India, right? You needed to organize it along some kind of rational lines. Uh, and the, 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 eventually the, the logic that was accepted was that you would, you would create different kinds of administrative units and the basis of these administrative units would be some kind of linguistic commonality, some kind of linguistic commonality. Now, of course, the problem is that uh, when you created these states here, okay, uh, so for example, let's say you, state the, you create the state of Maharashtra, okay, well, Maharashtra did not exist as a state before. Okay, the independence of India. In fact, actually, uh, Maharashtra, the present day Maharashtra only came into being, you know, about 10 years after independence. In other words, the reorganization of Indian states that took place in 1950 was not completed at that time. There were some cases which were left for later resolution, right? Maharashtra is one of the examples. Well, Maharashtra had a very substantial number of speakers of Gujarati, okay, which is the language that is spoken, predominant language that is spoken in Gujarat, right? So uh, similarly, if you look at the case of Tamil Nadu, you've got substantial number of speakers uh, of uh, Telugu, uh, 
uh, and Malayalam, these are the neighboring states uh, who get left behind in Tamil Nadu. Right? And similarly, there are going to be Tamil speakers who are you going to find in Andhra Pradesh. And one of the things that's happened, of course, in the course of the last 50 years is that you've had substantial migrations taking place within India. Right? So one question to think about is that whatever the inherent logic of linguistic states in 1950, the question is whether that logic is going to be persuasive as we move into the future, because one of the significant changes in India that we're talking about right, is obviously the increasing numbers of migrations that are taking place within India itself, right? And taking place not only because of globalization, uh, but we're also talking about the fact that people are moving uh, to these places uh, because they are salaried employees of the central government, for example, right? Okay? Right? So this is the rough situation that we're talking about with respect to language, and there will be occasion to look at some of these conflicts that have taken place over language later on. All right, any questions at this point? Um, I just wanted to clear that up, give you a much better sense of what is the, the status of these languages. I haven't said much about English at this point in time, the status of English in India, other than to convey to you the fact that it's the official language. Uh, but uh, if you really looked at the number of speakers of English uh, in India today, uh, uh, one would have to make a distinction between speakers of English who have command over idiomatic English, right, who understand the nuances of the language, uh, and other speakers who have uh, a kind of a working knowledge of English, okay, a working knowledge of English, uh, whereby they see English merely as a tool for economic advancement, right? So I think you would have to make a distinction between those who view English as part of a kind of a inheritance, a global inheritance, right? They're interested in, you know, uh, uh, in English, not simply because it's a tool for economic advancement, okay? But because knowing English opens up your worldviews in different ways, as knowing any other language opens up your worldviews in different ways, right? But for them, for the large majority of the people who actually have some kind of knowledge of English, it may simply be a way to instrumentalize the language. That is that you use it because you want to actually, you know, uh, create a niche for yourself in the economic marketplace, okay, right? Uh, but if you're looking, for example, at uh, literature in India today, right, and what the dominant impression in the West is about Indian literature, obviously the literature that the West knows anything about, that is Indian literature, it's a literature that is actually produced in English. And I think there's no question whatsoever that if you're looking at, let's say, you know, uh, 10 of the 20 major writers in the world today writing in English, they're coming from India, right? Because India is obviously a large market. Uh, in fact, after the United States and the United Kingdom, it is the third largest market in the world for English language books, okay? And if you're looking at the global, uh, you know, publication industry and so on, uh, publishing industry, uh, there is no question whatsoever, again, that India occupies a huge niche in it, even with respect to English. Forget about all the languages that are indigenous to India. Right? And there are people like myself who now take the view that, uh, yes, English may have come uh, to India 300 years ago with the coming of English rule, uh, but there are people like myself who take the view that English is now, in fact, an Indian language. It's completely indigenous to India, uh, used widely, at least by certain kinds of uh, elites and as well as the middle class. Okay? Uh, but on the other hand, I think it would be very difficult to argue that English is the mother tongue of anyone in India. I mean, there may be people, there certainly are, I know quite a few, uh, uh, of whom it could be said that their strongest language is without any question whatsoever English. Okay? But nonetheless, it would be very difficult to argue that English is their mother tongue. Right? So English is something that they would have picked up at a relatively early age and then persisted with it. Uh, they went to English language schools, English medium schools, right? Uh, and English becomes a language that they're most conversant with, the language that they you know, used for, in fact, daily conversation. And, and again, the problem, uh, it, that, that if, you look at, if you look at India as a whole, you're going to find that the, that the situation is somewhat different because if you come from North India as I do, the likelihood is that even when you speak Hindi, you're going to intersperse a lot of English words. But if you come from, let's say, Bengal, or if you come from um, uh, Tamil Nadu, okay, uh, the likelihood of that happening is diminished. That is that when two Tamil speakers are talking with each other, okay, the likelihood is that the vast bulk of their conversation will, will be in Tamil. 
Uh, whereas when two Hindi speakers are talking to each other, uh, the likelihood is also very great, especially if they tend to be educated, that they're going to use a mix of Hindi and English constantly. Okay, right? And so that's the sort of situation I think I would like you to bear in mind. And then again, we're going to see some complexities develop uh, over the course of time. All right, let me now begin then. Having dispensed with all of that, let's move into the next stage of questions. Because again, I want to remind you that for this week, what we're doing is we're really looking at India uh, sort of as a kind of an overview of, uh, of what the situation is uh, in India and the neighboring states in the post-1947 period down to the present day. Right? Now, the next set of questions I want to raise are the following sort. Number one, to what extent has the experiment in democracy in India been successful? Okay, and of course, you would have to say, well, how do we gauge this thing called success? You know, what are the criteria that we use? Okay, uh, do we use uh, uh, the criteria uh, of a free press? Okay, uh, do we look at the fact that, well, India is the only country in South Asia, really, uh, that for the most part, uh, I mean, Sri Lanka would be another example, uh, but certainly Pakistan and Bangladesh would not be the only country, really, that has had uh, general elections consistently from 1951 down to the present day, right? That you have a you have a parliament that has worked for the most part, okay? Um, you, India has not uh, had uh, what you might describe as totalitarian rule. It has not had coups, right? So forth and so on, right? So you could say that well, we could use this as an index of India's success as a democracy, right? Okay. Um, and you could also look at, obviously, the institution of a free press, right? Uh, I mean, if you look at the press in India, uh, I think it would be reasonable to say uh, that uh, in all the languages, in all the major languages, you have a very, very substantial press. And now, of course, you have to talk not only about uh, print media, you have to talk about, you know, satellite television, internet you know, all of these kinds of things as well, right? But if you're, if you're using these kinds of criteria, which I think would be the kind of criteria would, that would be used ordinarily um, by, let's say, an organization called the Freedom House, which is an organization in the U.S., which basically, you know, every year uh, creates a list of uh, uh, democracies, okay? And what does it do? It basically looks at things like political freedom. To what extent do, uh, do political prisoners have rights, okay, in a certain country, right? To what extent is the press free? Right? Uh, do they have elections or not? Now, if you're using all of these criteria, uh, I think uh, it would be reasonable to say uh, that India is uh, a reasonably functioning democracy. In fact, in some instances, a very good one. Right? But what if you used a different set of criteria, a very different set of criteria? So let's look at, let's say, economic criteria just for a moment. Okay? Um, and you could say, all right, to what extent uh, can we say that people in India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, each of these, in each of these countries, the same question could be asked, okay? Uh, and might even be more important in the other countries in South Asia, because clearly, according to the political criteria, Pakistan and Bangladesh would not be considered democracies, right? That they've not really had free general elections, so forth and so on. Uh, to a substantial degree, some people would argue that the press in, in Pakistan, for example, is very free. And that may well be the case. But I'm saying that if you're looking at certain kinds of criteria, such as elections, have they had military coups there, so forth and so on, then it's clearly the case that Pakistan uh, and Bangladesh do not qualify. Okay, right? And then, therefore, we could say that other criteria uh, might have to be weighed in more heavily. And so the question would be, to what extent can we say that in India and in all of these countries, um, everybody has access to such things as safe drinking water, electricity, Free education, primary education, okay, right? Uh, healthcare, job prospects, so forth and so on, right? You can go down the list, okay? You can go down the list and you can come up with all of these different criteria. And so one of the things you can do is you can look at something called UNDP, right? So that's the United Nations Development Program. Uh, and what they do is that every year they issue a, uh, a human development index, it's called. Okay, Human Development Index. And what does a Human Development Index do? It looks at a whole range of criteria. Okay, So one of the biggest ones that they look at is uh, what percentage of the population is literate, 
literate okay what is a literacy rate right in a certain country okay they would also look at gross national product uh, they would look at uh, what percentage of the population has access to hospital beds yeah United Nations Development Program okay right and they are the ones who have create you know created I mean th this thing that I'm describing to you the human development index right so you look at all of these kinds of things and then you say all right another set of criteria is what percentage of the population actually has access to safe drinking water right we know that in India today um, 20 percent of the population has no access to electricity 20 percent we know that the literacy rate in India is approximately I'm giving you a rough figure here because it's sometimes hard to make a calculation for this and you get a variation of five ten percent but we're saying roughly half of the population of India is literate okay fifty percent is a literacy rate in India uh, officially sometimes a figure that is given is sixty percent then of course you can also say well what exactly is literacy if you know how to sign your name uh, does that make you literate okay um, I remember the case of my grandmother by the way my maternal grandmother so uh, we're talking about a middle-class family uh, when my maternal grandmother who died a few years uh, about 20 years ago uh, she had to leave India for the first time in her late 70s uh, to go to Canada uh, and to go to another country obviously you need a passport uh, and when you apply for a passport you have to be able to sign on the form uh, and in India of course uh, uh, it's not one form there are always 10 forms and each form has to be signed you know it's in triplicate so it's like 30 signatures uh, and when you've got these 30 signatures you can't sign them 30 different ways right so you actually have to tutor a person on how to sign their name so she actually had to be tutored how to sign her name because in lieu of a signature in India even down to the present day you can actually use your thumb impression okay that's legal tender if I may put it this way okay that is that you go to a bank and if you don't know how to sign your name you know you put your thumb impression there okay and if uh, and that thumb impression serves in place of a signature okay right so was she literate after she knew how to sign her name obviously not because if, if the definition of literacy is being able to read uh, then clearly that she's not literate uh, but then again this is to some extent you could argue subjective because read what okay right I mean what levels of literacy are we really talking about and I want to make an argument here which is not uh, going to uh, if I may put it this way uh, appeal to you necessarily unless you really start thinking about it in a very different way I'm going to suggest to you that we have to be very careful when we use such measures such as literacy okay to determine where a country stands on the scale of development okay and I'll explain to you why and I want to make a distinction between literacy and being literate okay now if you consult let's say the Oxford English Dictionary okay um, you can consult some other you, you know reasonably authoritative work such as Webster's uh, unabridged dictionary if you wanted to but the Oxford English Dictionary is, is, is in my view the best one particularly because uh, uh, for you know the that is the the longest version you know the 20 volume plus ed edition uh, that for each word it gives you a history of the word it gives you illustrations of how the word has been used and you get an idea when the word was first used in the English language okay um, and by the way for those of you who don't know all of you have automatic access to it through UCLA free of charge so you just go to uh, oed.com OED uh, and you will have immediate access to this dictionary all right now you will find that the word literate is several hundred years old literate right so we could say um, of such and such person that he or she is literate uh, the word is used by people such as Milton okay um, so we're talking about several hundred years ago it's used by him the word literacy only came into the English language a little over 100 years ago why should that be the case right and what bearing does it have on the kinds of things that I'm trying to suggest to you right and keep in mind the general argument I want to make I'm trying to suggest to you that there has become a uniform way all over the world of trying to assess where one country stands where one country stands on the development ladder okay so it's, 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 it's a ladder and you say a country is more or less developed why because so, so much percentage of the population 
okay, is literate. So much percentage of the population has access to safe drinking water, right, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so you look at all of these, these are the different criteria that are used, okay, by the United Nations when it decides that this is where you're going to place a country. So if you look at India, for example, by the way, uh, I mean, there are like 186 countries in the Human Development Index. India is somewhere between 150 to 165, okay, way down, way down, along with a few other nations of sub-Saharan Africa, so forth and so on. All right, way down. And uh, the reason for that has to do with the fact that it has a very low literacy rate, right? Uh, that the infant mortality rate in India is very high. Maternal mortality rate in India is very high, right? These are the kinds of things that you would look at, okay? Now, this is what you have to bear in mind. And I'm suggesting to you that there's a substantial intellectual problem, okay, with this, right? The substantial intellectual problem has to do with how is it that we decide that certain criteria are going to be used rather than other criteria, okay? And why are we using these criteria? Because in some sense, we want to be able to say that some countries are superior to others, if I may put it this way, right? So if you look at this idea, it is not substantially different from the 17th, 18th, 19th century ideas, right? Where, according to the colonial powers, you could rank the countries and say that, well, you know, Britain and France are the most developed countries in the world, right? And they're most developed for various reasons, such as economic power, the Industrial Revolution, right? But also because they would say, ah, we treat our women better than these countries do, okay? Right? And the literacy is, if I may put it this way, a kind of an evaluative scale. It creates an evaluative scale. In other words, it's not a neutral objective scale when you say that the literacy rate in such and such country is 50%, and other country is 80%. You have made an evaluation which says that the country that has a literacy rate of 80% is higher, is superior to a country that has a literacy rate of 50%, okay? But then, of course, we're going to have to ask, what good is that literacy, okay, if it does not actually deliver a political and economic system to a people, okay, that gives them a certain degree of justice, equality, so forth and so on, right? In other words, you'd have to establish that a higher literacy rate for a certain country, right, is always, if I may put it this way, a social good. It may not be, right? So the fact that my, my grandmother, for example, was illiterate, right, well, what would that say about her human qualities? She might still have the finest human qualities, right? Literacy will not tell you anything about that kind of thing. What literacy does is it introduces a way of saying that this is where we put one country in relationship to another country. It's a way of evaluating. It's a way of making, if I may use that cliched English expression, a value judgment, okay, about one country in relationship to another country. All right, so this is something that you would have to bear in mind. Now, having said that, Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that literacy does matter. Okay, and then I'm saying to you, the larger question was, okay, so to what extent is India a democracy? To what extent has the experiment in democracy really worked in India? Let's put the question that way. To what extent has it worked? And so we have already dealt with the political side. Now we're looking at the economic side. And I'm saying if you look at the economic side, <coughs> you're going to come up with all of these indices which show that at least with respect to these indices, it seems that India has not really been very successful as a democracy. That is that there has not been an adequate distribution of social goods. And social goods includes things like access to safe drinking water. I mean, I think that that's absolutely essential, right? Access to safe drinking water, right? Electricity, health care, so forth and so on, right? If you use these kinds of criteria. However, we can complicate the economic criteria. You will be astonished to learn, for example, that in 1947, okay, in the year of Indian independence, okay, what was the life expectancy in India? Does anybody have an, any idea what the life expectancy in India would have been in 1947? You know, what is the life expectancy in the US? Does anybody know? Yeah, right now. For, for, you know, it's different for men and women. 
Okay, but I mean, you take the average. What is it? Yeah, mid 70s. Mid 70s. Japan is higher by four years, roughly. Okay, right? So, um, and we know that in the US too, in 1947, if you take the US as a comparison, it would have been lower. But, but would it have been substantially lower? Would it have been, let's say, in the 50s? Or, you know, where would it have been? <coughs> and what would be the life expectancy you think in India in 1947? 27. 27, yes. That was a life expectancy in India at the time of independence, 1947. Okay, life expectancy in India now, if you average it out for men and women, okay, is about 60. Okay, and again, it's, it's on the whole, it's higher for women, although again, you have various kinds of anomalies. Uh, and the anomalies have to do with the fact that, 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 as I had explained to you before, and we look at it in greater detail later on, India is one of uh, uh, few countries in the world, along with Pakistan and Bangladesh and several others, uh, which has a, a much greater number of males than females. Okay, right? But what I'm saying to you is, if you look at something like life expectancy, it is very clear that enormous strides have been taken in India to improve life expectancy. Okay, so obviously we are talking about greater access to health care, right? All of these kinds of things. Question? I, I can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, yeah, this is, when they say life expectancy, they're averaging it out. So they're looking at mortality rates and they're looking at infant mortality, all of that, right? And then, and th that's what it averages out, okay? Right? And I'm saying to you that if there has been such a substantial change in life expectancy, right, well, clearly to some extent, there is some kind of distribution of social goods that is taking place in India. It also tells you something about to what extent the colonial state took responsibility for the welfare of its subjects. Okay? You could also look at, for example, things like famines. I think it is unequivocally clear that even though you have a very substantial rate of malnutrition in India, in fact, it has been estimated, and I think these estimates are actually quite correct. I don't think that they're uh, exaggerated. I, it, has been, it has been estimated that half the population of India suffers from malnutrition. Okay? Perhaps even more. Sorry? Even for right now? Oh, yeah. For right now. I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about right now, okay? So even though half the population of India suffers from malnutrition, you do not really have what you might describe as either starvation deaths for the most part, and there's a very small part in a state called Orissa, okay, which has had starvation deaths over the last 50, 60 years, you know, and talking about a few hundred, and every now and then that particular district is prone to it, okay? And there may be one or two other instances of that. But if you're looking at India, in totality, it is very clear that you do not really have starvation deaths as a whole, and you certainly do not have famines, okay, in the post-1947 period in India, right? So during the colonial period, one of the greatest afflictions of, of India was the fact that you had severe famines. In fact, in 1943, which is in the midst of World War II, uh, we know for certain from all the work that has been done over the course of the last 60, 70 years, that there's a famine that strikes Bengal, eastern India, you know, kills two or three million people. And during that time, the British are exporting grains from India, okay, to Australia, where there's a war going on, you know, the, you know, part of the Pacific War, okay, right? So we know that the colonial state was, if I may put it this way, grossly negligent towards the welfare of its subjects. Now, the question is, is that true to the same degree in India? Because I think that it is, it is also clear that, yes, I think a substantial portion of the Indian population, in that sense, do not have the rights that citizens do. That is, they don't have access to these kinds of social goods, right? Okay, but obviously, here the question is not simply one of degree, that, that the degree of the problem is not as acute as it was under the colonial period. One could make that argument. I think the question here has to do with that now you have a sovereign state. Okay? During the colonial period, you did not have a sovereign state. Right? So you have a sovereign state. What is the degree of responsibility that the state has to its subjects? Okay? And should we rely upon the state 
only for the delivery of these social goods or does civil society have a role to play in this as well right that's one other large question that I would like to place before you okay so we've looked at very briefly at political considerations we've looked at economic considerations and again there are a great many other economic considerations that we have not looked at uh, to let me give you an illustration uh, one of the most significant changes that I think that has taken place in India in the post-1947 period, post period is the growth of cities, the growth of metropolitan clusters. Okay? Right? And so if you're looking at um, Indian cities today, where well, you're saying that you've got cities such as Delhi, Calcutta, and Mumbai, each with a population of 15 million or more, okay, 15 million or more, and you know that if you're looking at the global cities around the world, uh, most of the cities which are going to be mega cities, okay, and which already are, but particularly in the years to come, uh, most of these are located in the global south. They're located in China, in India, places like that, right? Okay, right? Enormous migration from the hinterland, from the interior, into these areas that become metropolitan clusters. Right? And of course, when you have enormous migrations of this kind, it puts severe pressure on the resources of those places. But it also says something about the fact that the rural areas are not able to sustain these populations. Right? Because why are people migrating? Right? Why are people shifting out of the countryside, moving into cities? And you could say, well, it has to do with economic advancement, better education prospects. I think all of that is true. But what would happen? one would have to think about it, why is it that you cannot have a state policy whereby you have all of these facilities and resources available in the rural areas as well, right? You know, so that you could have a more equitable distribution of population so that you do not have this enormous crush of people moving into the big cities. And then for those of you who've seen Hindi films, you would know that, I mean, I would say that uh, uh, one of the reasons why um, Bombay is such a magnet has to do exactly with the representation in the Hindi film, okay, about the kinds of, you know, opportunities available. It's a dream factory, if I may put it this way, right? That's how it's very often described, kind of a dream factory of India, right? But this has been an enormous change in India in the post-1947 period. Uh, I think it's also true of Bangladesh and Pakistan, but certainly the data for India makes it quite clear. All right. Now, a related set of issues which are usually not talked about when people look at things like the kind of progress a country has made or to what extent that country can be viewed as, as a set of democracy. That is the question of culture in India, okay? Question of culture. And when I say culture here, I'm talking about um, obviously not simply literature and theater and all of that. I think all of that is very important. Uh, but I'm also talking about the creation of what one might describe as public spaces, okay, for certain kinds of dialogues and conversations, okay. Now, does India have, if I may put it this way, a kind of a public space for conversations about the kind of society that we want, right, what we consider to be a desirable society? What is the place of civil society and its institutions, right, in the creation of a culture in India in the post-1947 period. And I think you can look at it in several different ways, but you can make a, the following bifurcation, okay? There is what I would describe an official view of culture in South Asia, okay? And in India, you can demonstrate it by the fact that in the years after independence, what the Indian state attempted to do was to promote an official view of culture by creating various kinds of institutions. So they created a National Academy of Literature. It's called the Sahitya Academy. Okay, they created a National Academy of Art. It's called the Lalit Kala Academy. Sangeet Natak Academy would be the National Academy for Music. Okay, and one of the things that you find is you find that the patronage of the state continues. So these organizations not only try to define what is good music, what is good literature, okay, what is good theater, what they also do is they extend patronage, right? And this is where you see, by the way, a continuity between post-independent India and pre-independent India, because 
remember that in the olden days, this patronage would have come through kings and rulers. Right? Through independently wealthy rulers, they would have been the ones who would have given the patronage to the artists, as was the case, by the way, in Europe. Right? I mean, you know, who is, who, who is commissioning these great works of music you know, by Bach or by Mendelssohn or whatever the case might be? In some cases, many of these works are being commissioned. And if they're being commissioned, they're being committed, co commissioned by native rulers or by princes, right? By the aristocratic elite. And you have a situation similar to that, of, similar to that in India. And that is, I'm suggesting to you, a role that is going to be taken over by the state in the period after independence. Okay? But then there is what you might describe as the unofficial sphere of culture. The unofficial sphere of culture. Uh, which would include such things as the Indian people's theater movement. Okay, that would be a very good illustration. So when you see, for example, street theater in India. Okay, now it seems to me that that street theater is going to give you a view of culture, which is going to be at odds with what is going to come from the state very often. Okay, it may or may not constitute a counterculture, but I'm suggesting to you that if you look at India as a totality, right? it is very clear that there is a kind of an unofficial culture as well. Now this unofficial culture can be created in all kinds of spaces and in many different ways. Right? Uh, so one of the very interesting ways in which this unofficial culture gets created is through what I'm going to describe as railway journeys. Right? In week nine, by the way, week nine you're going to read a short piece on Indian trains. Right? India has a massive network of trains. Right? Goes back to the colonial period. Uh, and some people are very nostalgic about it because they say, ah, that's a very good illustration of the kinds of things that the colonial state did for India, right? It created a train network. Uh, and of course, we have to see why they created the train network, okay? Uh, whose purposes were being served. And of course, as is the case with all of these institutions, once an institution has been created for certain purposes, eventually it gets used for other purposes as well. We know that trains were used. Uh, in the 1850s for the first time to rush supplies to British troops to fight the rebellion of 1857, right? There was a huge rebellion that took place in India in 1857, and we know that this is the first effective use of railways by the colonial state, right? Because it could send troops and supplies quickly from one part of the country to another, wherever the fighting was taking places, wherever they needed reinforcements. So we know that originally the railways in fact, were extremely useful for the colonial state. We also know that if you look at the history of the railways through the second half of the 19th century, moving into the early part of the 20th century, that eventually the railways gets to be used, obviously, for other purposes of communication, pilgrimage, so forth and so on. And Mahatma Gandhi himself was probably the person who used the Indian trains more than anybody else. Right? The, one, of the, one of the major ways in which a nationalist actually, if I may put it this way, spread their influence throughout the country. Okay? Now, the railway network has persisted in India. It has grown in India in the post-1947 period. And you would have to look at the train and train journeys as a place for the creation of certain kinds of new identities in India. Okay? Because typically, you could say that it was true of a substantial portion of the Indian population in the 19th century that most people would not have traveled more than 20 or 25 kilometers from where they were born in their lifetime. Right? Typically, that would be the case. You know? And you would go even 20, 25 kilometers, you would go even that far simply because you would have to probably go that far in order to create a marriage alliance for your son or daughter. Right? You don't want to have a marriage alliance within your own village for various reasons, so you go to the neighboring village where you have people who belong to the same caste network, and that would mean that you might have to go 20, 25 kilometers. Right? Now, there are, of course, Indians uh, who traveled overseas, and, peop and people who were taken uh, to work in Mauritius, and Guyana, Suriname, Fiji, you know, a large number of countries where you have a huge Indian population, but these are people who are taken as laborers. Right? I'm talking about people within India Right? What would be the degree of mobility that these people would have had, other than people who were trading castes? Okay? And other than people who went on pilgrimages, because one of the major occasions for traveling in India would have been pilgrimages. Right? You happen to be a devotee of a particular god or goddess, 
and, and you want to go to the major shrine dedicated to that god or goddess, it might be a thousand kilometers away, right? Um, and obviously these are long, arduous journeys, right? So if you leave aside pilgrimages, if you leave aside traders uh, and their networks, okay? Um, what you're saying, for, for other people, what would be, have been the degree of their mobility? Relatively little. Okay? And of course, the trains facilitated that mobility to a very substantial degree, but that mobility has been facilitated by a great many other things as well, because obviously the kinds of things that might restrict you to your neighborhood, the kinds of constraints that you might feel, these constraints have, to some degree, disappeared in the world that we're living in today. Right? And I'm saying that all of these things you would have to think about because we're speaking about the creation of different kinds of identities okay, in post-independent India. Right? And this is all part of what I'm describing as the sphere of culture. Now, the most important part of that sphere of culture, we're going to dedicate a whole session to that. But in this overview, I want to spend the remaining three or four minutes talking about that. And that is cinema in India. Okay? Uh, one of the great, uh, one of the greatest, uh, 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 you know, uh, if I may put it this way, uh, 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 misperceptions about Indian cinema is that Indian cinema is predominantly a Hindi language cinema. That is not the case. Okay, uh, it is true that the vast bulk of the mainstream Indian cinema that is known to people, okay, outside India, okay that all of these are films that are made in Hindi. The studios are mainly in Mumbai, formerly known as Bombay, right? Okay. But if you look at the cities in the south, the four states in the south, each of them has a flourishing cinema. Okay. Uh, and, and together, put together, the number of films made in Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, and Kannada exceeds the number of films made in Hindi. All right? It's something that you need to bear in mind. Right, so that there is, there is an, another large cinema in that part of the country as well. Right? But that's kind of a factual detail. The principal consideration for us is what is the relationship between Indian cinema and Indian society. Okay? So to what extent does the cinema reflect some of the values of, its, of the people of India? To what extent does it reflect the kind of political situation in India? Is it a commentary on it? Does it create an independent sphere of its own? Right? This is what I mean when I say, what is the relationship of Indian cinema to Indian society? Right? And, you know, the typical Hindi film, the typical Hindi film has changed, by the way, but when I say the typical Hindi film, let's say from the 60s, 70s, 80s, right? Uh, the plot would be something uh, of a kind where you have a rich boy, poor girl, want to get married, uh, and of course, parental objections, right? At least on one side of the family, maybe not on the other, but usually on the other too, because they'll say, oh, she'll never, you know, this situation is not good because the class differences are enormous. Uh, sometimes the difference is maybe religious. It, it would usually, typically, for the Hindi film, it was, it was class differences, right? Okay? Typical plot. And by the way, for those of you who see Hindi films, or if you don't and you want to, uh, don't worry about. Uh, the story too much because it's usually chicken feed, if I may put it this way. Uh, you, you know, what is really critical to the Hindi film are a number of different elements. Uh, but this was a typical story. And the sociologist, would, the academic sociologist would come along and would say, ah, Indian cinema is just escapist. It's, you know, if you see the mansions shown in the Hindi film, I mean, you would think that you were in Beverly Hills. Okay, right? You would think that, oh, these were typical mansions, right? Uh, but that's not the point, okay? And is this sociological explanation that Hindi cinema is just a form of escapism, is this really sufficient to enable us to understand what is the relationship of this cinema, okay, to the society as a whole? What kind of, if I may put it this way, mythic structures does it represent, okay? Uh, what is its relationship to other narratives that have existed in Indian society, to forms of storytelling, right? What is its relationship to forms of storytelling that have existed in India for two, three thousand years? So yes, you have a new technology that's come in, right? But does this technology have some relationship to the kinds of stories that have typically been told in India before, right? So this is the sort of thing I would like you to keep in mind. Obviously, we're going to look at this in much greater detail later on. But 
I think that this pretty much sums up this section here. And uh, be sure you've done the reading for this week because we're going to start looking at some of the arguments in greater detail now for the lecture on Thursday.